Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Pioneer Baptist Church and our study through the book of Judges. Grab your Bibles, open them up to the book of Judges, chapter 1. And if you don't have your Bible with you, go ahead and open up a tab in your browser and go to Bible Gateway and find the book of Judges, chapter 1 there. Or open up your app on your phone and go to Judges, chapter 1. We are just getting started in this wonderful journey through the book of Judges. It's a book of discouragement, of failure, and of depravity. It's really a uh, warning for modern people as we read it to not make the same mistakes that Israel made. And what we have found is that God made a covenant with his people as they went into the promised land, as they received the fulfillment of a 400-year-old promise that was made to their fathers. They were told, if you worship the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who revealed himself to Moses in a burning bush, the God who in signs and wonders delivered them from the affliction and slavery that the Egyptians had poured out on them, the God who had led them through the desert for 40 years in safety, providing food and water. If they would follow that God, then they would have victory over every people group that they went up against in this new land. The people of Israel did have work to do. God was fulfilling his promises. God was giving them good gifts, but God also entrusted to them a responsibility. They had to act as his judges and they had to go in and bear God's wrath against these nations that had rebelled against him, who had sinned against him. And so God told them to go in and destroy the cities, kill them all, and to not leave any alive, to tear down their altars, to tear down their idols to their false gods, and set up a God-centered, Yahweh-centric worship system only, to not allow any of the evil that was in this land previously to exist. As a result, if they would do this, God would go before them and give them victory everywhere they went. He would establish them in the land and they would be able to have peace and prosperity. It would be a land flowing with milk and honey and God would be their God and he would be their people. This was the second Eden. This was what it would be like for God's people to dwell with him in perfection but they had a work to do. What they had to do is drive out the sin that had polluted the earth after the first Garden of Eden. You guys do remember that Adam and Eve were in the garden, the earth was perfect. They sinned against God, God kicked them out of the perfection of Eden. The curse that God put upon them affected the entirety of the whole world. And the entire world world was touched. Plants, animals, dirt, skies, stars, everything was corrupted by sin. And God was bringing his people into his promised land and they were to drive that evil out. They were to force it out. And they had an opportunity again to be obedient to God. But we find that they fall short of that just like we often do. We always think if we just saw God or if he just did this miracle or if we just had this advantage that our patriarchs had, we would have done something different. We would have lived differently. But ladies and gentlemen, the truth is humanity has done the same thing over and over and over again. God knew this, but God was showing us just how corrupt our hearts were, just how corrupt as we read it tonight that our hearts are. And because of this corruption, we are in need of something greater than ourselves. We were put in a garden initially, in perfection, and we chose sin. Our father and mother, Adam and Eve, chose sin. The Israelites, as God's people, were promised prosperity and peace with God. All they had to do is drive out the evil, drive out the weak, drive out the things that God had put his wrath upon, and we could have had all of our fellowship with God, and we couldn't even do that. And so now we find that we can't live in perfection, and we can't drive out in perfection, and so we are in need of a great God salvation, much bigger than the one that delivered them from Egypt. We need one that will deliver man, both 
Israelite and Gentile from the wrath of God that is due to the sins that we commit against him. Ladies and gentlemen, in the first half of the book of Judges, we see that they go into the land and they have great success. Everywhere they go, they call on God. God goes before them, particularly Judah and Simon, and they drive out the remnants of the people in every place they were. And then we find in the verses uh, 19 um, in uh in chapter one, the first resistance, it's to, we're not told why, but we're told that Judah couldn't drive out the people of the valley because they had iron chariots. And that's the first remnant we see loitering behind that, that the people of Israel failed to drive out. They're in the midst of success this first half of the chapter. They're driving everybody out. God is keeping his covenant promise to them that if they obey him, if they do what he says, he will establish them. And then we see in verse 24 that they make a packed with a group of people so that they could spy out the land. And as a result, they let those people live. And what we see is a first breaking of the covenant between God and his people. The instance with Judah, we're not told that they broke a covenant with God. But in this instance, they make a covenant with an individual and let them live. And thus breaking the covenant that they had with God. And as a result, they were able to take that city, but a remnant rose up another city in another place that would become a thorn in their side that they would have to fight in days to come. And we learned last week that it's extraordinarily important for us to finish the job to root out the sin that God has called us to root out, whether it's in the culture or in our own lives, because when we do not, when we leave a remnant there, it's like yeast. It will permeate through the whole loaf of bread. Just a little yeast changes the entirety of a loaf of bread. And sin, just a little bit of it, if we don't root it out, will permeate itself throughout the entirety of our being and our churches and our society. And we will all pay a consequence for that disobedience. So brothers and sisters, it's important and that is God's people today, that we root out the things that God tells us to root out. And I hope that you're being diligent about doing that today. In the second half of the chapter that we're going to begin with tonight in 27, and it's going to go all the way down through chapter 2 and verses uh, and verse 6-ish. We may go a little farther, but it's the closing of this section, the story and what we'll notice is that in this last section, it goes on to tell us how all the rest of the tribes of Israel failed to conquer their land, uh, to totally eradicate all presence of the people. And we're given ideas as to why they didn't do it. You see, brothers and sisters, our sin is oftentimes couched in good intentions. We will defy the standards of God, we will lower them for the sake of what seems reasonable or pragmatic to us. We don't think what God says works very well, or maybe we don't understand why he is so stringent about it. And so we tone it down a little bit. And what I want to tell you today, brothers and sisters, is that though we are tempted to tone down God's standards and his laws, it will not change the fact that God is holy and perfect our interpretation of God's standards and laws will not make his standards and laws any easier for people to reach. And it will not turn away God's wrath upon those who do not reach his standards. That's the hard truth. We can justify sin. We can justify lowering God's standards all we want. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, that we are tempted the same way they are back then to look at things through our perspective and tone down God's rhetoric, God's wrath. We do this with all kinds of sins. We take it way too easy on ourselves and on our brothers and sisters. We do not tell them to eradicate sin from their lives. Instead, we say, well, we can understand why you'd keep that there. And maybe in a little bit of time, as you get around to it, you can get the rest of that out. Well, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you today, that sin will take root, it will multiply in different forms and in different places, and it will destroy you, your culture, your church, and all the people you love, because that's what sin does. So as we read these passages, I want you to ask yourself a question. What sin 
have I not rooted out of my life yet? What sin do I know that I'm guilty of that I have not treated seriously? What sin is in my community that I could fight against, that I could help educate people about, that I could warn people about so that our society and our loved ones can have a chance at peace with God through Jesus Christ? What sin can you get out of your life so that others can be benefited by the holiness that you bring to the world. Let's ask that as we read tonight. So turn your attention to chapter one of the book of Judges, verse 27. And we're just gonna read a little bit because you're gonna notice in verses 27 through 36 that there are a lot of repetitions of people not doing the exact same things. So I'll read the important parts, but check this out. In verse 28, it says this, it came about when Israel became strong I'm sorry, pardon me, I started on 28. It says, but the men went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and named it Luz, which, is, which it is to this day. Verse 27 says, but Manasseh did not take possession of Beth Sheen and its villages or Tanakh and its villages or the inhabitants of Dor and its villages or the inhabitants of Iblium and its villages or the inhabitants of Megiddo and its villages. So the Canaanites persisted in living in that land. And it came about when Israel became strong that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. Listen in verse 29, it says, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites. Verse 30, Zebulon did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Verse 31, Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko. Verse 33, Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh. But when they became strong, they made the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and the other Canaanites subject themselves to forced labor. The people of Dan, the Amorites, were forced, had forced the sons of Dan into the hill country until they did not allow them to come down to the valley. Listen to this. It says in verse 35, yet the Amorites persisted and living in Mount Haris, in Ajalon, and in Shalabim. But when the power of the house of Joseph grew strong, they came, became forced labor. The border of the Amorites ran from the ascent of Akrabim, from Selah, and upward. As we finish chapter one, I want you to notice this. It's not the end of this section of text, but it is the end of Israel's incomplete taking of the promised land. What he tells you here is that 10 out of the 12 tribes, not counting Reuben and not counting Levi, failed to take the land that was allotted to them. Levi wasn't designated any land at all. So that means 10 out of the 11 tribes that got land did not clear their land of the Canaanites. And the thing that we see here is that simply put, they put them to forced labor. This is the theme through the back half of this uh, message. In the front half, when we saw Judah fall short, and when we saw um, the men of the house of Joseph fall short, it was simply a matter of reason. So Judah thought, hey, the king who we cut off his fingers and his toes should suffer the way that he made other kings suffer. And we talked about last week how we don't believe in the fact that God gives true justice in death. Sometimes we think that people should suffer in life more because we don't believe that they will suffer at all in death. And that just shows that we don't believe in hell. We don't believe in God's wrath. And we should, brothers and sisters, entrust these sinners, these evildoers to the judgment and the wrath of God. We should not take it upon ourselves to pour out just justice without regard for what God has said. This, brothers and sisters, is going to end in sin every single time. Now, the sons of Joseph, when they made a deal with this gentleman so they could spy out their land and let him live, they broke God's covenant out of expediency. They wanted to save the lives of Israel troops. And of course, this made sense, doesn't it? It 
seems wise to take tactical advantages when you can, unless God has commanded you to not make any deals with the people you're going to come against, so that God can get all the glory from your victory and it cannot be attributed to wise warfare. You see, God held Judah and the sons of Joseph accountable, and they were not able to clear out their lands. And then we see a list of people who didn't clear out their lands, and eventually their thought was, when we get strong enough, we will force these people to become slaves for us. And so, what we see is Israel's reasoning. We have this great big land, and we have these great big cities. We're not even large enough to pursue it or fill it ourselves yet, so we will need people to take care of it. Otherwise, it will grow up and become wild. So what should we do? We should let these people live and make them slaves of the Most High God. Make them slaves of us, his people. And brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, as wise as that might seem as a steward of what God has entrusted to them, it is against what God told them to do. It is a lack of faith to believe that God can provide what they need to make the land subdued and be prosperous without their cleverness without their rigging the system. Brothers and sisters, we do this all the time. We make these pragmatic choices to justify not following through with what God has for our lives. We leave sin intact. We leave lifestyles unholy. We leave them unscrubbed of their sinfulness. We leave the stains of sin in our life and we don't clean them up and get them out. And we have all kinds of good reasons why we do that. But the result of those rebellious actions is what we're about to read next in chapter 2. So join with me in chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, and we will read all six verses together. Now the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim, and he said, I brought you up out of Egypt and led you into the land that I have sworn to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. And as for you, you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I also said, I will not drive them out before you. But they will become as thorns in your sides and their gods will be a snare to you. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the sons of Israel, the people lifted up their voices and wept. So they named that place Bochim, and there they sacrificed to the Lord. Bochim means house of weeping, and they named this place where God met with them the house of weeping. Because what happened was, is while these people were still alive, these people who were led through the desert for 40 years, Joshua and Caleb, the ones who were alive when the exodus from Egypt happened, these people who saw God's great deliverance as they went into the promised land, his covenant keeping, his promise keeping, had so quickly been deceived to turn away from what God has commanded. And God calls them out on it right away. And he doesn't do it through a prophet, does he? No, he comes down as the angel of the Lord himself. And it's interesting because the angel of the Lord did not appear to an assembly of people, but it says this, the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim. He made a journey. He looked at the land, he saw the people, he saw what was going on, and he drew the people together at this place. And at this place, he reaffirmed to them that I have kept my covenant with you. And here's the best part, brothers and sisters. I not only have kept my covenant with you, but I absolutely will keep my covenant with you. The good part about that is that if Israel does what God says and pursues holiness, then God will uproot the people from the land and he will give them victory. But also, if they don't do what he says, 
the other part of the covenant he made with them is that he will destroy them and remove them from the land. God reminds them of this. And so the people weep because they've just inherited the promise of their fathers. And without even trying, they've almost given it away to sin. Brothers and sisters, even in our best efforts, we cannot please God with our actions. Even in our best efforts, we are casually giving away the grace that God has extended to us, the beauty of this life, the riches that he has afforded to us. We use them for our glory. We use them according to our wisdom. We do not give God the glory and the worship he's due. We don't live life as if it's for him. We live life as if it's for us and our family. Brothers and sisters, everything we do, whether in word or deed, should all be done to the glory of God. And that means whether we eat or sleep or whatever we do, we do all for him. And that means that we have to eradicate sin. That means we can't do things on our own. Brother, sister, if you're here today and you're a church member and you seem to continually have these same shortcomings and sins in your life, I encourage you to start taking them far more seriously. Do you want to see the blessing of God in your life? Then take seriously his commands to root out sin, to do away with your flesh and your own desires, and to live for the glory of his kingdom alone. When you live like that, brothers and sisters, he will bless you, he will fill you, he will satisfy you and sanctify you. His covenant that he made with them all the way back then will guard you all the way till heaven today. I promise you, God will be with you and he will bless and multiply you and keep you. That doesn't mean you're gonna have eternal life this side of heaven. You will die, you will suffer, but brothers and sisters, you will do it for his glory, for his kingdom and the soul satisfaction, the the uh, proximity that you will be able to have with God, the peace that passes all understanding that guards our hearts in Christ Jesus. This is the gift we have. And it is more fruitful and more fulfilling than any bar of gold or any house that we could build or any family that we could muster because we were created to be with God and we were created to live life with him. Brothers and sisters, we're just like Israel. It's not my point tonight to tell you to change your lives in such a way to where you can do better than Israel. I'm trying to tell you to be humble enough to admit that you're tempted just like Israel and that you are in need not of using your own wisdom to move forward in your Christian walk or to establish God's kingdom. You are in need of the power of God in your life as you cast yourself upon him and as you obey his word as accurately as he has revealed it. So I encourage you to do that. If you're lost today or you don't have a relationship with God, the truth of the matter is God's wrath goes forward and even his best, most blessed people fall short of his standards. Were it not for Jesus who died in our place, who lived a perfect life that we couldn't live, were it not for him giving his righteousness to us as a gift, we would be lost and hopeless, even the best of us. And so I encourage you to take that free gift The Bible says it's a free gift of God so that no one can boast before him. Jesus Christ has died for your sins. He's died for the sins of Israel and he's died for the sins of everyone who messes up God's good plan and his good gifts. I'd encourage you tonight just to throw yourselves upon him and trust in him tonight. I want you to notice this. When the angel of the Lord spoke these words to them, they lifted up their voices and they wept and they sacrificed to God. I want you to notice this, that even with just the little bit of knowledge that they had, they were able to still return and worship God. They went into the promised land, and when Joshua had left, you guys remember right at the beginning of chapter one, they prayed. They sought God's word through his prophets and his priests, and they said, who will go up for us first? God answered them and said, send Judah up first, and he will take the land. And sure enough, God went with him, and he did. And it's only when they started doing their own thing that the wheels actually started to fall off the conquering of the land. But brothers and sisters, God didn't abandon them. No, he came down to them, revealed to them their sin, called them to account. They repented, they sacrificed to him, and to the best of their ability, they followed him for the rest of the days of their life. Listen to what it says after this. In verse 6 and through verse 10, 
it gives us a summary that we're going to come back to next week. But listen to it now. When Joshua had dismissed the people, the sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. Now you guys know, and I know, that Joshua has already died. He's not there to lead this conquest. So what is this doing? Well, it's taking us back to a summary, an overview of what just happened. Joshua led the people into the land. They conquered it. They broke the backbone of the kings. And then they had minor excursions into the land. So when Joshua dismissed them, each one went to and possess the inheritance of their land. And that's what we just read about. And then verse 7 says this. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work of the Lord, which he had done in Israel. And then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at an age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timnah Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of of Mount Gash, all that generation also was gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason we have to drive the sin out, the reason we have to follow God's command and do what he says to build his kingdom is because the future generations that God loves and cares about are at risk. Joshua died and people continued to follow throughout the rest of the generation who had seen what God had done. But they didn't drive out the evil. They rebelled against God. They didn't follow him all the way. And when those people who had seen what God had done and still rebelled, when they died, it says that there arose a generation altogether who did not know God or the works that he had done. In one generation, the good news of the gospel evaporated. And there are many people listening to this tonight who are over 45 years old. And when you were young, America was considered a Christian nation for all of their rebellion, for all of their segregation in horrible ways. People would claim to be Christian by philosophy or culture, at least. Brothers and sisters, in one generation, that perverse generation, your generation, that did not follow God closely, but had seen the miracles that he had done through evangelistic efforts like Billy Graham and other places around the world. You guys who didn't follow God quite closely enough have inherited the ability to watch as your sons and daughters and your grandchildren don't fear God at all. They don't know him. And my question to you is this, in the days that God has given you that you can remain here, what will you do? to make sure that his kingdom is passed down to the next generation. I will tell you this, the very first thing you need to do is weep and offer your body as a sacrifice to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us that. After you do that, after you repent from your sins and you turn your life over to God, you need to obey him with the passion that you disobeyed him in the first half of your life. You need to obey him as passionately as you possibly can so that the next generation might have the grace of knowing that we have a covenant-keeping God who will bless us beyond measure if we but follow and worship him alone and who will curse us and crush us if we choose any other God but him. May God give you the courage to turn from your sins and live with passion the rest of your days. Until this Sunday at 10.30, I look forward to seeing you then, and I'll be praying for you and your families. If you're able to, come see us. If not, there should be, Lord willing, a sermon up Sunday morning from the book of 1 Corinthians. God bless you all. Have a great night.